Welcome to SKB, Dissecting the Serial Killer's Brain. I'm your host, Caroline, a university biology professor and true crime junkie. Thanks for joining me on my quest to understand evil. At one point, I had attempted to launch a second podcast, even though, you know, I don't, I hardly have time to do the first one. But it focused, it was going to focus on crimes that took place on the water. So I figured I would release uh, this first case as a little bonus um, episode. Well, actually, it'll be two episodes. As two bonus episodes um, to maybe help fill in some of the time while you are quarantined. It was November of 1961, and Arthur Deperault was finally realizing his dream of taking his family sailing through the tropics, ultimately spending a year together aboard a luxurious sailboat. To test the waters, the Deperaults would spend a week sailing around the Bahamas. But before this initial trip was complete, tragedy would strike. Welcome to Water You Killing Me For, a podcast exploring murder and mayhem on the water. This is Case 1, Episode 1, The Duperall Family Massacre, Almost Paradise. I'm your host, Caroline. Who were the Deperaults and why did they embark on this voyage? Arthur and Jean Deperault were married in December of 1944. They met while they were both working in Washington, D.C. Arthur Deperault was from Green Bay, Wisconsin. He graduated from high school as president of his senior class in 1939. After finishing high school, Arthur attended Lawrence College until 1942 when he dropped out to enlist in the Navy and join the efforts in World War II. Arthur was a small man, just 5'8", and he was thin, so he had to bulk up in order to be accepted into the Navy. And after leaving the Navy, he continued to keep physically fit. This is something that he would carry through the rest of his life. After attending basic training, Arthur was sent to the Far East, And it was on his voyage to the Far East when he discovered his love of the ocean. He would often spend hours on the ship's deck staring at the horizon and taking in the sights, sounds, and smells of the open sea. A far cry from the ice-covered green bay that he was from. Arthur's destination in the Far East was Burma, now Myanmar. Upon arriving in Burma, Arthur served as a corpsman on the recently completed Burma Road. It was finished in 1938. And the Burma Road was the supply route from Burma, which was then a British colony, to the interior of China during the Second Sino-Japanese War. And in 1942, the Empire of Japan um, occupied Burma in part to prevent any assistance um, from getting to China. So the Second Sino-Japanese War was a military conflict that was fought primarily between the Republic of China and the Empire of Japan from July 7, 1937 to September 2, 1945. As a medical corpsman, Arthur spent time on the front lines witnessing horrific battles with the Japanese. He treated soldiers um, who had malaria, dysentery, and he also treated wounded soldiers along the Burma Road. He spent a total of 20 months in the Far East, and then he was sent to D.C. Arthur was stationed in Washington, D.C. until February of 1943 when he volunteered to go back to China as a medic. He served um, overseas in China for most of 1943. In late 1944, Arthur returned from China, and he was assigned to the Pentagon. And it was while in D.C. in 1944, 
1954 that he met his future wife, Jean Brosh. Jean Brosh was from Madison, Nebraska. Uh, she was dark-haired and gregarious. She complimented the red-haired, serious, and quiet Arthur. In 1944, Jean was working as a secretary at the FBI headquarters, and this is where she and Arthur met. Jean was independent and adventurous, which was highly unusual in those days. Um, the couple ended up getting married in December of 1944. So Arthur was discharged from the Navy in November of 1945, and he and Jean moved near Green Bay, Wisconsin to live with Arthur's parents while he commuted to Chicago to attend Northern Illinois College of Optometry, where he graduated in 1949. Once he completed his education, he opened an optometric practice in Green Bay. Arthur was a leader in his profession and a leader in the Wisconsin Optometry Association. Early on, Arthur made a really great decision to take a huge risk and sell a brand new vision product called the contact lens, right? So that was a great move on his part. So that afforded him a very successful practice. In 1947, Arthur and Jean started their family. Their first child was named Brian, um, and he was born, like I said, in 1947. Next came Terry Joe, who was born in 1950. And finally, Renee, who was born in 1954. What was life like with the Duperalts? Well, they lived in a white stucco house on wooded property near a country club on the east shore of the Bay of Green Bay. So they lived almost out in the country. Arthur and Jean wanted their children to know that there was a great big world outside of their small little existence. And Arthur often spoke of his adventures traveling during the war and his dream of sailing the seas. And it was in 1960 that Arthur realized in order to live out his dream of taking his family on a year-long sail that he needed to do it sooner than later. So at the time, in 1961, Brian was 14. He was a freshman at the local high school. He was small like his father, but very muscular. He took judo. He played baseball and golf. However, he also was very artistic, so he played the piano, and he liked to draw and design buildings and build things. Terry Joe in 1961 was 11. She was tall and slim. She was blonde, so was Brian. Um, she was quiet. She was a strong swimmer. She loved ice skating, water skiing, and horseback riding. She was actually the loner of the family. She preferred to hang out and play by herself. Terry Jo loved animals, and back in the 1960s in rural Green Bay, um, it was fairly safe, and so children in these nice, secure places had to create their own dangers, their own pretend dangers. So she invented, Terry Jo invented her own adventures. She would play alone in the woods, building forts and hiding from her enemies. I think my favorite story about Terry Jo that I, that I read was... Um, she would find animals, like dead animals in the woods, and she would uh, get their, their fur, and she made herself a Tarzan loincloth because she loved Tarzan. Tarzan was her hero. Some might find such a story disturbing, and it might remind you of a young Jeffrey Dahmer who would carry dead animals back to his little shed um, behind the house where he would dissect the animals and he would um, uh, put them in acid to get rid of their skin and their muscle and fat tissue on the bones. But to me, this story reminded me of things that I would have done as a child. When my when our family dog died when I was about five years old, I wanted to go out and dig up her body to see what she looked like. And thankfully, my father had enough presence of mind not to let me do that, but he loved to tell that story. The youngest of the Duperalt children, Renee, was seven in 1961. She was a girly girl. She preferred dresses to play clothes. She was quiet and shy, but a very happy child. She had dark hair, unlike her blonde siblings. Arthur, Jean, and the children were athletic, and they loved the outdoors. Arthur, Jean, and Brian enjoyed golfing. Arthur was a great handball player. Um, he became very competitive, won awards later. The whole family were highly involved and engaged in their community. 
To me, it sounds like they were just an all-around nice, great family. Arthur was a bit of a badass. Once he spent hours trying to dig the family dog out of a 10-foot trench that the dog had fallen into. Another time, he dove fully clothed into the Green Bay to save the daughter of a friend who had slipped through her life ring. He was also a very loving and caring father. So not only was he kind of a badass, but he also really would take care of the children. He was often the one that would nurse them back to health if they were sick. He would make Terry Jo tea if she didn't feel well. Well, Arthur wasn't the only badass in the family. Jean was a little bit of a badass as well. Jean was stunning and stylish. She was artistic, adventurous, especially in her cooking. She would cook things like fried green tomatoes, um, pickled pig's feet, uh, avocados, like different things that people did not necessarily eat on a regular basis in the 1960s. When Terry Jo would injure herself, cut herself bad enough that she would need stitches, it was actually Jean who would suture up Terry Jo's uh, injuries, which, you know, I've, I've, uh, I've sutured up a lot of animals over the years, um, but I just don't know that I could do that with my own child. Arthur had a love of the water, and he was an avid sailor. He was experienced in something called ice boat sailing. And ice boat sailing is, is really an extreme sport. It's high speed and it's dangerous. It demands a great deal of skill. An ice boat has four basic parts. The main body of the vessel, as with any watercraft, is known as the hull. It has a runner plank, which is made of usually wood, laminate, or metal. Um, the runner plank lies at the stern of the boat beneath the hull. Then there are two runners that are attached to the plank, one at each end. Then there is a third runner, the steering runner that attaches to the bow. The steering runner comes equipped with like a parking like brake, which um, helps prevent wind from carrying the boat away during loading or the start of a race. The runners look like and function like big giant ice skates. And that allows, or they, they allow the boat to glide across the ice with little friction. Then he also was great at, at sailing small lightning sailboats on the bay. And he would sail these with his children and with friends. A lightning sailboat is a sloop rigged sailing dinghy. And a sloop is a sailing boat with a single mast and a fore and aft rig. A sloop has um, only one head sail. So Arthur was no stranger to sailing. He had never sailed a huge sailboat for an extended period of time, but he obviously had the skills to, to, um, to sail. So he and the family had been looking for a sailboat to purchase, but they couldn't find one that they liked enough or that fit all the criteria. So instead, they found a sailboat that they could charter. So by 1961... Arthur found someone who could tend to his practice for the year, and he packed his family up, and they headed to Florida for a short sailing excursion to try things out before they took off for an extended period of time. So the Duperalts would embark on a one-week trip to the Bahamas on a sailboat named the Blue Bell to try things out to make sure that they could get along okay and that, um, that everybody would be okay with being on a sailboat for an extended period of time. The Blue Bell was moored in Fort Lauderdale at a place called the Bahia Mar. And back in the 60s, that was a very fancy yacht club. Now it's still, I mean, it's still there, I think, um, but probably not quite as fancy. So the Blue Bell, I posted some pictures on social media as well as on the website if you want to see what the Blue Bell looked like. The Blue Bell was owned by a man named Har Harold Pegg, who was a pool contractor. So he built swimming pools. He had purchased the Bluebell not long before the Duperalts climbed aboard that November of 1961. The Bluebell was being captained by Julian Harvey, a decorated war hero, and his new bride, Mary Dean Jordan. The Duperalts commissioned the Bluebell for about $100 a day. They brought their own rations and they paid the salary for Julian and uh, Mary Dean. She went by Dean to all of her friends. So I wanted to see kind of how much that would be today. So I did a little Google searching and I found the daily rate for a similar sailboat. Um, of course, not exactly the same, but much fancier, I think. 
I found one that was all inclusive for two to six guests for a weekly rate of about $13,500 or $1,900 a day. And then the average sailboat captain, um, the average sailboat charter captain's salary per year is now about $40,000 or $800 a week. And in 1961, that would have been about $87 a week. So not a huge amount of money. The Blue Bell was a 60-foot long, 45-foot wide catch. And a catch is a two-masted sailing craft whose main mast is taller than the mizzen mast or the aft mast. The name catch, K-E-T-C-H, is derived from catch or fishing boat. And a catch tends to be a fore and aft rigged pleasure yacht similar to a yawl, but a catch's mizzen mast is taller and its mizzen sail is larger than a yawl's. The Blue Bell was originally a racing yacht. It was long, low, and narrow. When it was fully rigged, it carried three sails, the mizzen, the mainsail, and the jib. There was a white wooden dinghy and a black rubber life raft along the left side of the cabin's roof and a white five-man cork life float along the right forward main cabin. There was a 13-foot main cabin with portholes, a skylight, seating, and a dining area. There was a small head and a kitchenette. There's also a small sleeping cabin for the children, a main bedroom for Arthur and Jean, and a crew cabin for Captain Julian Harvey and his new bride, Dean. So the Duperalts arrived in Fort Lauderdale shortly before they were to embark on their trial sail, and the boat was provisioned for a week-long sail. The Blue Bell actually set sail on Wednesday, November 8th, 1961, from Fort Lauderdale heading to the Bahamas. 14-year-old Brian had brought along a 22 caliber rifle to shoot at sharks. And this is not something that would have been a big deal in the 1960s. I think now we would kind of uh, raise our eyebrows at such a thing. But back then, that shooting at sharks for sport was not anything strange. So as the Blue Belt departed Fort Lauderdale, it headed towards the Gulf Stream. And the Gulf Stream is an ocean current that begins in the Gulf of Mexico, and it stretches to the tip of Florida. So they headed towards the Gulf Stream en route to the islands of the Bahamas. The group then arrived in Bimini, which was the nearest of the Bahama Islands, that Wednesday evening. Their trip to Bimini took a little bit longer than expected, so Julian could not present their papers to customs because they landed after 5 p.m. In the 1960s, the Bahamas were still under British rule. It was in 1973 that the Bahamas gained their independence. Thursday came, and Julian did not present papers that day either. Um, although, if he had presented the papers, what that would have meant was that the Duperalts and, and Captain Harvey and his wife would have free access to all of the islands of the Bahamas. Instead, uh, Captain Harvey sailed the Blue Bell towards Great Isaac Key, and the group spent Thursday night anchored outside of this Great Isaac Key. On Friday, they sailed to the deep northwest Providence Channel on their way to the village of Sandy Point, which is located on Great Abaco Island. Here, the Duperalts were entertained by flying fish, giant sea turtles, sharks, porpoises, all sorts of really cool stuff. The Bluebell then entered the Great Bahama Bank, um, and the Great Bahama Bank has these beautiful emerald waters. So when the Bluebell could not get into shallow harbor, um, the group would take the dinghy ashore. And so the family spent the next couple of days making their way through the shallow waters of a few of the islands, um, snorkeling, uh, playing on the beach, that sort of thing. Now, Terry Jo, the 11-year-old, she remembers standing in shallow water one day, kind of gazing back at the blue bell, when she noticed Captain Harvey was standing on the deck and he was staring at her in her new bathing suit, and it made her incredibly uncomfortable. You know, 11 years old, girl, you're beginnings of puberty and very self-conscious, so it made her really uncomfortable. But she quickly forgot about it and went back to snorkeling. The Bluebell finally anchored at Sandy Point Harbor, and Julian went to customs to present their papers. On Friday, an old friend of Harvey's, who he ran into um, at Sandy Point, came aboard to have dinner with the group. And he reported later that Julian and Dean had been drinking, but the Duperalts had not, but everybody was having a good time. And everybody seemed to be getting along very well. The Duperalts loved Sandy Point Harbor. 
And they actually commented to um, a number of folks at Sandy Point that they, they thought that they would make that their winter vacation spot from that point on. They just loved it. So early Sunday, the Blue Bell was anchored off of Sandy Point um, after having explored an area near Gorda Key. On Sunday, Arthur met a young local fisherman, and he invited the fisherman aboard for dinner. And afterwards, that fisherman said that it was a happy group. Everybody was having a nice time. So by all accounts, it seemed like the, the voyage was going well. In letters back to her family, Dean complained about um, having no time by herself and that sort of thing, having the people around constantly. But other than that, there didn't seem to be anything um, that was amiss. On Monday, November 13th, a tanker called the Gulf Lion spotted Bluebell's dinghy towing the Bluebell's rubber life raft behind it. The crew of the Gulf Lion brought Captain Harvey on board. Captain Harvey identified himself as having been the captain of the Blue Bell, and he said that he had with him the body of little Terry Joe, he said, but it was actually the body of seven-year-old Renee. Julian told the following story to the crew of the Gulf Lion. Julian said that at around 11 p.m., a powerful gust snapped the main mast in two. A 50-foot length came hurtling down, piercing the deck and rupturing the fuel lines, which burst into flame. While Harvey single-handedly fought the blaze with extinguishers, his wife and their five passengers retreated to the stern. By then, however, the catch was going down. While the others leapt into the water, Harvey launched the dinghy, dove overboard, hauled himself into the lifeboat, and made a desperate effort to find Mary Dean and the Duperalts, shotting himself hoarse in the darkness. No one answered. At last, he came upon this little girl floating face down in the water, her body buoyed by the life jacket. Captain Harvey hauled her onto the dinghy, but she was already dead. The others had vanished into the sea along with the bluebell. The captain of the Gulf Lion called the Coast Guard, who then launched an air and sea search for survivors or for ship remains. The Gulf Lion dropped Julian off in Nassau in the Bahamas with $180, and he flew to Miami the next day, which was Tuesday, November 14th. When Julian arrived in Miami, he called the Coast Guard, and he was asked to appear two days later for an inquest. And so he was to report for the inquest at 9 a.m. Thursday, November 16th, 1961. As Julian arrived, he was noticeably in good spirits, regardless of the fact that his new wife was likely dead and that he was responsible as captain for the deaths of the Duperalts. Julian pressed the Coast Guard investigator, Lieutenant Murdoch, about survivors and their wreckage. Julian was stuttering, which was a lifelong pro- problem that would appear under stress. When he found out that there was no sign of survivors or wreckage, Julian exhaled heavily, seemingly relieved, and then sat down. What the Coast Guard investigators didn't know was that the Blue Bell was the third boat that Captain Harvey had lost in the last six years. At this point, Julian sat down and began to tell his story of what happened that night on the Blue Bell. We set sail from Sandy Point on the east side of the Providence Channel shortly after dark Sunday night. It was our intention to stop for a few hours in the lee of Great Stirrup Cay, get three or four hours of sleep, then proceed to Great Isaac anchor and leave for a little more sleep than reach Fort Lauderdale Tuesday night or Wednesday morning. When we left Sandy Point, the weather was good. There was a fresh breeze coming up, about 15 knots. At night, I always travel with reduced canvas. I had the stay sail up and the main sail up. I did not have the mizzen or the flying jib up. Under this sail configuration, the bluebell could easily carry 25 or 28 knots of wind without heeling over uncomfortably. She could carry more than that. In other words, that was very safe. A conservative sail plan. There were a few small rain squalls in the area. We encountered one of them about halfway between Sandy Point and Great Stirrup K. Because it had been such pleasant sailing with no power on, everyone was in the cockpit. It was a big, roomy cockpit. The children were there with some minor bedding and were napping. Then this small squall hit us, and a monstrous thing happened. In a twenty-knot wind, the main mast failed one-fourth or one-third of the distance above the deck. It was not a failure of stage, it was a failure of the wood in the main mast. A 50-foot length of the main mast came hurtling straight down, piercing the deck like it was made of paper. It was just like a telegraph pole going straight down on the deck. 
It tore through the one-inch white pine of the deck and continued on down to the bottom of the hole. As it gained momentum, the stays from the main mast to the mizzen mast gave a gigantic pull to the mizzen, breaking it in at least two places. The mizzen mast collapsed among us in the cockpit. This collapse of the entire rig reduced us to a bare hole wallowing in the sea. As he spoke, Julian's stutter got worse. He took long pauses. His jaw quivered. Fortunately, no one was hit directly by the falling mizzen, but my wife and Dr. Dupro were cut on the legs by splinters. I was steering at the time, and I started the engine and let that have a slow ahead to give us control. I briefly checked the wounded and told everyone to sit fast and not to panic, that I was going forward to get the cable cutters and get rid of all the cables around us. I ran forward, clearing my way through the debris that went below in the forecastle, and finally got the cutters. Emerging from the forecastle forward, I saw that a fire had started in the cockpit area, and because the wind was down the deck, forward to the aft, the six passengers were moving aft, away from the flames, onto the fantail. I seem to remember them taking some of the boating cushions aft with them. The children already had on their life preservers. As they were standing on the rear deck, very close to the gasoline tanks, I was naturally in deadly fear of an explosion. I ran below, picking up two five-pound fire extinguishers. The water was already a foot deep in the hold, coming through the hole made by the main mast. The boat was wallowing, and the water was rushing backwards and forwards, making it hard to maintain. The passengers astern could see me doing this, and they apparently decided among themselves to jump overboard and wait for me to get the boat back to them rather than stand there facing the fire in that area. They had confidence in me. I cut the rail with the cable cutters, bent the stain chain, and managed to launch the loaded sailing dinghy without swamping it. I could hear faint yells, although we were going into the wind and they were downwind of me. I tied the raft and ding together and rowed to the stern. It was pitch dark and I could see nothing in the water. I had a carbide water light. It didn't work. I threw it overboard. He says that he had screamed himself hoarse, shouting for the others. Then he came upon Rene. By this time, the bluebell had gone down very quietly. As she sank, the fire went out. There was never a huge general fire, just in the cockpit and stern areas. I was so exhausted, it was all I could do to get the little girl up in the lifeboat. I tried artificial respiration on her. At this point, he began to repeat parts of his story, and said that he had pulled Rene into the raft by himself with no help, and how exhausted he was because he had to lower the dinghy and raft without aid. The sea was building up. I tied the little girl's body in the rubber raft, but by myself. Then I must have stayed in the area two hours before giving up hope of finding the others. After that, we drifted until about 6.30 in the morning. I still kept shouting. It was cold. At daylight, I opened the emergency rations. I could see that I was faced with a problem. The wind was from the southeast, and I was afraid that I might drift into the Gulf Stream, roughly from miles west, and on north. So from the first, I rationed the food. The sun came out and warmed me up, but I was continually doused by the waves. The sea by that time was up in the neighborhood of eight, nine, or ten foot combers, and the wind was a steady twenty knots. The tops were hissing. About 1,300 hours, I saw a large steamer coming directly toward me, about five or six miles away. At three miles distance, it veered off to my left and missed me by at least a mile. However, I was told that one man on the stern saw me. They turned, came back alongside, and picked me up. They fed me and treated me for mild shock, radioed the Coast Guard of Miami immediately, and proceeded to put me off at Nassau. During Julian's account, Lieutenant Murdoch found a few things odd and was thinking to himself, why did Julian keep saying, by myself? How did a mast pierce the deck in a way that Julian said it did, plunging straight down? Why did the passengers stay aft when Julian was able to make his way forward? Why didn't the great stirrup key lighthouse keeper see the fire? Why didn't Julian sail the dinghy to the nearest island, only a few miles away? Once Julian was finished with his story, Murdoch asked several questions of him. He asked Julian, he said, why didn't you call for help? Julian replied that the radio antenna had been taken down by the main mast. Murdoch asked about the flares that every sailboat, every boat has, and Julian replied that he didn't even think of the flares at the time. Murdoch asked him why Julian didn't hoist the sail on the dinghy, and Julian answered that he was just too exhausted that night. And by morning, the sail would be soaked because he was towing the life raft. Murdoch asked Julian about a carbide water light, and Julian responded that he thought he just had to throw it overboard and didn't see a plug. A carbide water light 
is a, a light that works by burning um, a ceiling, which is created by the reaction between water and calcium carbide. And so in order to get the light to work, you have to pull a plug to allow water to hit that calcium carbide. And I would assume that an experienced sailor would have known that. Murdoch asked Julian if everyone was awake when this happened. And Julian said yes. He said that all the children had been um, in the cockpit with some light bedding and everybody was kind of hanging out. Moments after Julian finished his testimony, one of the Coast Guard captains came rushing into the room with shocking news. What was that news? Well, join me next week to find out. What Are You Killing Me For? is a bi-weekly podcast produced in collaboration with Boat Unlimited. Follow the podcast on most of your social media platforms at Water Killing or visit our website at www.waterwaterkilling.com. Don't forget to subscribe to What Are You Killing Me For? on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spreaker, Podcast Republic, and SoundCloud. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a minute to rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcast. And if you enjoyed this podcast, subscribe to my other podcast, SKB, Dissecting the Serial Killer's Brain, in which I discuss the biological and psychological factors that led to such monsters as Ed Kemper, Jeffrey Dahmer, and Anthony Sowell. I do crazy amounts of research for all of these episodes of the podcast, so if you're interested in taking a look at the references um, that I used for research, check out the show notes for details. And a special thank you to my handsome and talented son, Kiernan Rivera, for voicing Julian Harvey. Next time on What Are You Killing Me For? It was November 16th, 1961, and second mate Nicholas Spakadakis scanned the horizon as the Captain Theo passed through the Northwest Providence Channel. As he continued to look out onto the seemingly endless ocean in front of him, he spotted something that caught his attention. What he saw that day would bring the rugged, sea-hardened sailor and his shipmates to tears. Sitting atop a white, oblong life float, alone amongst the infinite waves of the unmerciful ocean was a young, beautiful, blonde-haired girl, her face painfully sunburned and gaunt. She would be proclaimed a miracle, this mysterious sea wave. But how did she end up in the middle of the ocean all alone?